All right. So when, uh, I think last week when we started the course, um, one of the things I talked about is you have um, a really sufficient knowledge of financial accounting, and I know this because Danielle was one of your instructors. So I know you understand financial accounting, and we talked about the difference between financial accounting and auditing and what we were going to do in this class. So clearly your knowledge of financial accounting is important to auditing. But in what you, and what, you will, what you know is that with accounting, what you're doing is taking that information. So a company engages in economic transactions, and they have to record those transactions. And we have these established criteria against which they're supposed to record the, those transactions, and that's generally accepted accounting principles. And so accounting is just that, recording, classifying, and summarizing the economic events or transactions that the company engages in. Um, so that they can provide that financial information to the capital markets or those users who are interested in the financial statement. Whereas auditing is determining whether or not that information that has been recorded reflects the true economic events that have occurred. Right? So auditing is saying, okay, you've recorded this transaction, but is this, the actual, is this how it actually happened? Is it recorded correctly? Okay, so accounting takes the economic information, auditing what checks on that information and ensures that it's recorded correctly. And also auditing is done by this established criteria, generally accepted auditing standards, which we'll talk about today. So just a, a definition of auditing is the accumulation and evolution of evidence about information to determine and report on the degree of correspondence between the information and established criteria. Evidence is any information used by the auditor to determine whether the information being audited is stated in accordance with established criteria. That established criteria is generally, audit, generally accepted accounting principles and auditing standards, generally accepted auditing standards, are the standards by which auditors are governed or guided to audit various accounts. And so when, we, when you guys are reading your chapters, um, especially as we start um, getting into auditing specific areas such as revenue, um, when we start talking about risk assessment, there are going to be auditing standards that guide. These are the minim minimally expected procedures that auditors should perform, and that's the established criteria by which they uh, are guided. We're going to talk a lot about evidence uh, in a few weeks when we uh, start to think about or talk about what we're doing when we audit, because we have to be able to issue an opinion on financial statements. How are you going to issue an opinion? You have to collect evidence. You have to evaluate something. So if you're going to determine whether or not the financial information has been recorded correctly, uh, determine the validity of the financial information or information that's recorded in the financial statements, you have to look at something. And what you're looking at is evidence. And we'll talk a lot about the importance of evidence, the types of evidence that are considered appropriate and sufficient um, the types of steps that auditors uh, engage in to collect that evidence. Um, that's what we'll cover over the next few weeks. Uh, there must be information in a verifiable form and some standards by which the auditor can evaluate the information. So I think we cover evidence in Chapter 8, I think, I'm not sure. But we'll talk, uh, uh, because evidence is obviously ex an extremely important part of the audit process because the auditor has to be able to support his or her opinion. And the only way they're going to be able to do that is with the appropriate amount of evidence that they collect. Um, the standards are really clear about this in terms of the type of person that should be conducting an audit. In the sense, what skills should they have? What, um, kinds of, what type of expertise should they have? So there's obvious, obviously there's a reason there's an auditing course, right? You're not taking auditing as an elective. It's a required course because the material that you learn here is the starting point or the foundation for you as auditors in your career. Right? Or even if you say, I'm not going to be 
you know, I don't want to be an auditor. It's still a required part of the accounting curriculum. So uh, because this, the state standards mandate that uh, auditing be a part of the accounting curriculum. So the standards talk about you having that, that uh, expertise, that training, that you, you be proficient. Um, and we'll talk, uh, when we talk about the standards, we'll talk about the general uh, standards of field work um, as well as um, reporting. So the auditor has to be qualified to understand the criteria used, must be competent to know the types and um, types of evidence, types and amount of evidence, I'm sorry, to accumulate to reach the proper conclusion about the evidence um, that has been examined. So in other words, the auditor has to, and we're going to talk about professional skepticism today. And so it is important to understand what constitutes sufficient, appropriate evidence. And so if someone hands you a piece of paper and there's a number on it, you're not going to blindly take that paper and say, OK, let me just check. You are not going to be robo-auditors when you leave this class, right? Because that means you have not, you have not learned anything if you just become a robo-auditor. And that's not my goal here. So we're going to talk a lot about professional skepticism. You have to be able to critically examine the information, question it, challenge it if necessary, to make sure it makes sense. And so the case that we're going to work on today that I had you read earlier, um, but prior to class, it gets into some of those things that are those um, types of behaviors or the types of thinking that you should have as an auditor. Um, the confidence of the individual performing the audit is of little value if he or she is biased in the accumulation and evaluation of that evidence. And basically what that's saying is a, that's the fundamental principle in, a, in auditing, okay, the foundation is that auditors have to be independent and unbiased. And so when we talk, we're going to talk about independence today as well. I'll talk about that more. And I'll talk about this concept of independence in fact and independence in appearance. Can someone who's done the reading give me an example or contrast the two, independence in fact versus independence in appearance? Do they mean the same thing? Does that mean no one did the reading? So no one has the book. That's not an excuse since I posted the chapters. <clears throat> independence in fact and independence in appearance. Just throw a wild guess out. Let's brainstorm. How about that? So say fact is. Okay, so why, uh, so independence in fact you say is objective and independence in appearance is subjective. Why do you think independence in fact, let's say, is objective? And it's facts according to who? Hmm? Say, I'm not picking on you. So facts according to whoever you audited? Facts according to the standards. You had your hand up, Yeri? Facts according to the evidence that you find. Did anyone else? So, ev so does, is everyone in agreement then that independence in fact is objective? Does anyone differ? Why do you say it's subjective? Perfect. I like the term, so I'm going to throw, pull out some words. There is a lot. There are a lot of different factors that require judgment. And the fact is, who makes the judgment? The auditor makes the judgment. And if the auditor makes the judgment, that means you as the auditor, David, can have a different judgment than Anton, can have a different judgment than Melissa, 
And so if that's the case, it's not objective. It's obje I, know why you, I know why you said objective, because you saw fact. The reason it's called independence and fact, and I actually prefer the term independence in mind, because I think if I had written there, the book uses the term fact, I think. But if I had written mine, I think you would have said subjective, right? You, you focused on fact. What they're say the reason that they use the term fact is because what they're saying is it's internal to the auditor, and only the auditor knows whether or not they've been independent. Had they been independent in fact, because first of all, that means that they did everything right um, by the book. They did not allow their own personal bias to um, guide their judgment. So that when they, so let's take an example where it's an inventory obsolescence reserve. So we know we have um, an accounting uh, transaction or an accounting issue that's subjective. So management is saying that the reserve should be a million dollars, and the auditors, after doing some testing, say that the reserve should be $1.4 million. Right? So there's this difference in opinion between management and the auditor, and management is going to try to convince the auditor that it should be a million dollars. Right? So if the auditor says, you know, no, nope, I think it's 1.4 million, we did our testing, here are all the reasons why, you know, um, I, I stand by my audit testing and this is the right number, um, and this is what we should book, they're not allowing any personal biases to impact their judgment and decision, right? But if an auditor says, for example, the management says, you know, we're one of your biggest clients, you know, you can trust us, and, you know, throw in all this other stuff, just take the number. Well, the auditor now has allowed their own, if they agree with management, despite the fact that their numbers and their testing tells them something different, they're allowing other things other than the facts to really, or other than their testing to impact, uh, impact their judgment. So they're not violating the rules of independence in the sense that they're recorded in, in uh, Rule 101 under the standards, but because they're allowing by other things to creep into their decision process, they're not necessarily independent. Right. That's a really um, simple, simplified case, and it, that's a very simple case. But if, if, if an auditor allows biases to creep into their judgment, right, and, and that causes them to change um, because, you know, they have incentives to side with the client, then people will, can look at that and say you're not really independent, okay? Because even though you're independent because you don't own stock in the client, um, so it's even though you're independent by all the rules, the fact that your judgment has been biased by your own personal incentives for that, uh, related to that client, then you're not independent in fact. No, independent appearance means you've met all of the rules. In appearance, so when we talk about independence, we'll go through all of, and we look at the video, you'll see all of the rules guarded, regarding independence. An auditor can own stock, um, have a direct financial interest in their client, and their other things. So independent in appearance means to the outside, I can, I can look at all of those things and see that, right? I can tell if you're independent in appearance, because all I have to do is go through this kind of checklist. Do you own stock in your, in your client? No. Does your wife own stock in it? No. So I could check all those things off. So to the public eye, that's something as a, a third party I can observe, you can observe. But you can't observe what's going on in my mind. So that's why independence in fact or independence in the mind is more subjective in the sense that you can't, no. Or at least you believe that, right? You don't have any intention, you know, to report uh, incorrectly or to, to side with your client, you know. Okay, is that clear? So when you think about independence in fact, equated with independence in mind. So at the time that you're making that decision as an auditor, okay, are you truly making that decision based on the evidence that you've accumulated, 
your knowledge of generally accepted accounting principles based on what your gut feeling is, that this is the right number, this is the right answer? Or are you being swayed by the client, your relationship with the client, you're trying to make a good impression on the client, or the client's a really good person, I'm going to cut them a break. Okay, so independence and facts relate to, is the auditor truly independent? We'll talk a lot more, and, and actually we're going to do a couple of cases and we'll talk about this a little bit more. Okay, so I think when we played, what you saw when we played the market game last week was, I think it was this class, right, where seller number three, I believe, the very last seller, took on a, oh, and by the way, that's the team, the seller that won was seller number three. I can't remember the buyer team that won, but seller team number three won. Um, and I think you guys knew that before you left here because everyone brought from seller number three for the most part. If, if, if each time um, if someone had an, uh, the first buyer, went, you know, would always buy from seller number two. Okay, I'm um, sorry, seller number three. They would always buy. So seller number three most times sold out all of their inventory. Beca and they said that their strategy, if I remember correctly, was that they wanted to establish this consistent reputation of providing you know, the quality of, quality of goods at a price commensurate with that quality. So in other words, they weren't trying to game the market. They weren't trying to cheat. They just wanted to make a profit, and they wanted to establish a reputation. Right. Well, remember three or four uh, um, rounds or five rounds, or we took away information about quality and just presented with price. And what we saw when that happened, I believe, was that a lot of buyers were reluctant to buy, right? They were reluctant to buy because they didn't have any information about quality. All they knew was price. And I think some people commented that there wasn't enough time for them to really get a feel for the reputation of the sellers in the market. And so they weren't willing to take that risk. And so that kind of plays into the fact that what auditing does is hopefully reduce information risk. An audit, a clean audit opinion or a, an audit opinion signals something to the market about the quality of those financial statements. In fact, the audit report says, if it's a clean audit report, it says the financial statements are free of material misstatements. They're prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, and I'm paraphrasing. But those are, some, those are some of the major points that are in there. It says the auditor is independent, right? So it's signaling this quality to the market. It's signaling information that the market can rely on, choose to rely on or not, but most times they would rely on it if you trust the reputation of the audit report, right? And so it reduced, and what it's doing is reducing your information risk as an investor in that company. And so the, again, those are some of the important reasons, that would be one major important reason for an independent audit. Right? So remember the last round of the game, you had the opportunity to buy the services of a verifier who for all intentions and purposes were going to provide assurance whether you, I think, I can't remember if you're going to do for sellers or buyers, but whichever group, right, you were going to signal something. That verifier was supposed to signal something. You as the seller or buyer groups had to decide whether or not the verifier was worth it because there's a cost to you, just like there's a cost to a company, of having audited, audited financial statements. Unlike the real world, okay, a company has no choice. If it's a publicly held company, they have to have an auditor. It's a cost they have to just deal with, right? Now, there are other ways they could put pressure on the cost or pressure on the auditor um, that, you know, to reduce costs, and that's another thing that will impede an auditor's professional skepticism, right, is that they have all kinds of pressures that the client puts on them to finish. So they might not conduct the, the audit as effectively, but 
when we talk about professional skepticism, I'll get into that more. But there's a cost that each publicly held company has to bear because they have to have financial audited financial statements. Basically, the regulators, the Securities and Exchange Commission says, we don't care that it costs you money. If you want to list on the stock exchanges, you have to bear this cost because we need to protect the capital markets. Um, so some things, as I pointed out, remoteness of information. Think about uh, companies that, you know, um, have, that are pretty large. The stockholders, they have thousands, hundreds of thousands of stockholders. Not all stockholders are going to have access to information. So the importance of the, the audit report becomes even more important for those individuals. Um, while all companies have a board of directors, and especially uh, as mandated an audit committee, as mandated by Sarbanes-Oxley, um, uh, that, that, I'm sorry, the audit committee be involved, as mandated by Sar Sarbanes-Oxley, directors are not part of management. They're there to protect the, they're supposed to be protecting or representing the shareholders of the company, right? So they're not a part of the day-to-day -day operations or the decisions that management make. They're separate from that. So there's still, there's that remoteness of information. Um, very large, comp complex organizations have, you know, locations all over the world, and they have different lines of businesses. In terms of the financial statements, Remember, I said the financial statements are the product of management, right? It's management's responsibility to prepare the financial statements, compile and record financial information. Auditors are only verifying that information. Um, lots of data. Um, some of you, I think, have uh, said you took uh, management information systems. Uh, when you talk about accounting information systems, accounting information systems, especially with ERP systems now, are very complex. Companies engage in very complex transactions. So think about um, Enron, it went down. Uh, think about financial services companies, banks, um, uh, you know, investment houses, the types of transactions they get into derivatives and mark to market and swaps and all these kinds of things. Those are very complicated transactions. The average user who's just trying to invest in a company is not going to understand those transactions. So it's, again, these are all reasons why it's important for an audit because auditors obviously will develop expertise. So I think what you'll find is those of you who go to public accounting firms, you're going to find that most of the firms, I think all of them at this point, have different groups and you're probably going to end up in one group or the other because what they hope, what they try to do is that they know that they have people who are knowledgeable in various areas um, so that they uh, have the appropriate level of experience and expertise on the, their different audit engagements. I talked about uh, information risk. So let's just summarize it. Um, okay, so when an information risk is obviously for as a user, you don't have access to the same information that management has access to as a user of those financial statements. And when I say user, you're an investor, you can be a lender, um, regula uh, regulatory bodies. So you don't have the information. Um, one of the things that an audit does is it allows you to have um, obtain information in the sense that some independent person or body such as the auditor, the audit firm, is verifying this information. What that makes you as a user or other users, that makes you more confident about the information. Right? So if an audit firm, which is why <clears throat> when you see uh, that their audit failures, why auditors are sued a lot of times. And this, this part of it is just this whole deep pocket phenomenon, but it's also because people looked at the audit report and relied on the audit report. Um, <clears throat> some of the disadvantages is there's a high cost of obtaining information. And 
And I know that right now, given the kind of environment that we're in where you can go on the Internet and get all kinds of information about a company, you're still not going to get, as it pertains to financial information, you're not going to get a lot of detailed financial information about a company. So you're not going to know the company's strategy, um, you know, for product pricing and how that strategy impacts their revenue stream. Uh, so there's, while there's a lot of information on the Internet available, there's not, there's not a lot of financial information that would be useful to you or that you would consider useful in making your investment decision. So there is a high cost of obtaining information. Um, some <clears throat> other things where if you have user shares information risk with management, so when users share information risk with management, right, there's no um, audit costs incurred, right, because the, and that's not really where, that's not an environment that we're really in, right? You don't share information um, risk with management you, because management has all the information, right? You, you're trying to get the information. Management has it. Um, as a result of that, you, uh, what you want to get to then are audited financial statements, right? Because in this way, your risk is reduced. It's not eliminated because if it was eliminated, we wouldn't have the losses that you see users suffer when a company goes bankrupt or there's a fraud committed or there's an Enron or WorldCom. But it does mitigate it. Um, some of the advantages is multiple users um, obtain the information. The information risk is reduced. There's minimal inconvenience to management by having only one auditor. So you could, if, if, if every user wanted to have management audited, that would never work, right? So the fact that management controls the process in the sense that they select the auditors, um, it reduces the cost to users. Just a quick... Um, diagram of the parties involved in this in the in the relationships amongst those parties. So the client actually hires the auditor via the audit committee. So prior to Sarbanes Oxley, client management hires the auditor, but now the audit committee hires the auditor. The only time a client is necessarily going to hire an auditor is in a private company, right? Because they don't have the mandate of the audit committee having to hire the auditor. Under PCAOB standards, for publicly held companies, the audit committee has to hire the auditors, not management. Um, then the auditor works with management, but you know they get financial statement information from management because they have to verify that financial information. Once they've completed their audit, they're going to issue a report. That report is used by external users, whether it's investors, regulators. And that reduces the information risk for users. Um, given once that risk, so that allows users to determine whether or not they want to invest in that company. They provide capital to the company um, based on the financial statements, the audited financial statements that the co the company provides to the capital markets. And that's for publicly held companies. That's uh, 10K information, right? Because 10K information is publicly available data. And at this, in, in this day and age, most companies, after they've completed their audit um, and issued their financial statements, they'll have their 10K information and their annual report in some cases online. So that information is read, readily available. Just quickly, um, I wanted to talk a bit about assurance versus attest attestation. So um, an assurance service, and which audit is an example of an assurance service, is where an independent professional um, uh, provides a service uh, that improves the quality of information for decision makers. So again, that's why audit would be considered one, right? Because when you think about what is auditing doing, it's trying to reduce information risk. Um, it looks at the audited financial or it looks at the financial statements and provides an opinion about the fairness of those financial statements. Um, assurance is a service which can be performed by CPAs 
or by a variety of other professionals. So auditing is only one type of an assurance service. Um, an attestation service is a type of assurance service in which the CPA firm issues a report about the reliability of an assertion that is, that is the responsibility of another party. In other words, such as auditing, the auditor is looking at assertions that management makes about the financial statements. And when we talk about, um, get a little further in the, in the semester, uh, we'll talk about we audit around these assertions. So auditors use management's assertions to develop their audit approach and their audit procedures. And that's how they audit. And so that's what an auditor is doing, right? They have to, they're looking at management's financial statements and the assertions that management is making about those financial statements, and they provide an opinion. Yes? Mm -mm -mm. No, listen, they're not approving it, because approving it means that all of a sudden auditor becomes some part of management. It's not an approval process. It's an independent process where they're looking at management's financial statements, and they're saying that these statements are free of material misstatements. That's an audit. That's under attestation. You can have different types of assurance services. Right, but this is a type of an assurance service. Assurance service is a, a, the bigger picture. This attestation is, is a type. So it, it, it's for, it is an assurance service, okay? But if this is just a more, so let's talk about the, the, the different categories. So here's an example, and the ones that we're going to focus on is the audit of the historical financial statements, okay? So this is a very specific type of insurance service, attestation, right? five categories of attestation. One would be an audit of historical financial statement, which is what we're doing. We're going to be covering in this course. An attestation of internal controls over financial reporting, which we're also going to be covering in this course. The three others are reviews of historical financial statements. So the attestation services on information technology and other types of attestation services. So these are, this is all information that somebody has given some, some independent third party, in this case the client, has made an assertion about those, that in this case let's say the financial statement. The auditor is going to provide, um, issue a report about that statement. So auditors issue a report about the financial statement. We have this criteria that says the audit has, you know, auditors have to follow these procedures to be able to issue a report on the financial statement. And that's what we're, so what we're going to be covering this semester are the generally accepted auditing standards that guide the issuance of audited financial statements and an attestation of internal controls over financial reporting. Okay, we're not covering reviews or any of these other attestation services. Any questions on that? So for an example, there are various types of audits. We're going to only, as I pointed out again, focus on financial audits, but there are operational audits as well as compliance audits. Um, so the annual financial statements would be an example of an audit, a financial audit. The information that we use that, or that auditors use would be obviously the financial statements they're making, um, uh, uh, providing assurance about the financial statements, um, the criteria that they use for that to, be, to guide their assurance on this is the generally accepted, auditing standard, uh, generally accepted auditing standards, and the available evidence that they look at would be documents and records, which we're going to talk about all of that over the course of the semester. So GAAP, and it's, just to be clear, GAAP guides the recording the, the rules for recording economic transactions. GAS guides the rules for auditing the assertions and the, those transactions that management 
have recorded in the financial statement. So GAAP guides the auditor's behavior. GAAP guides management's behavior or guides the financial statement. Um, quickly, big four firms, national firms, regional, large and local firms, and small local firms. The overwhelming majority of publicly audits of publicly held companies are done by the big four international firms. You have some national firms who do quite a bit, um, but the big four do most of the publicly held clients. Uh, regional and large local firms are uh, um, much less. And small local firms, no, they don't have publicly held clients. Or if they, um, okay, I want to talk a little bit about the relationship Sarbanes Oxley Act, um, the PCOB, <coughs> and the SEC. So the SEC, you're all familiar with. Um, you know, the SEC is responsible for the, you know, protecting the capital markets or ensuring that the, the participants in the capital markets are protected. So all publicly held companies are required to file their um, financial statements with the SEC. They have all kinds of rules, uh, guide, deadlines of when, uh, by which time financial statements should be filed. Um, so all companies have to issue a 10, uh, file a 10K with the SEC on an annual basis. The PCAOB, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, <clears throat> came about as a result of Sarbanes-Oxley after all of the accounting scandals and auditing failures. The PCAOB is responsible for regulating the accounting profession for those firms who audit public companies. So for the most part on that previous chart, the big four large national firms and to in some extent the small um, uh, regional firms are going to fall under the preview of the PCAOB. If they audit publicly held companies, they are going to be regulated by the PCAOB. So they have to follow the rules and regulations of the PCAOB. So <clears throat> the PCAOB, uh, actually took uh, the place, um, well, prior to the PCOB, I should start that way, the accounting profession regulated itself via EAICPA. Once the scandal happened and the failures happened, they lost the ability to regulate themselves. Um, the PCOB goes in to the public accounting firms and they inspect their audit engagements on a you know, on a random basis. The firms have to allow the PCAOB, it's a, a, you know, government entity, has to allow the PCAOB access to their account, their audit engagements and their records. And they do an inspection. What the, they'll do is randomly select uh, various audits and they'll have their team come in and review the audit procedures that the firm used, review the conclusions they reach, um, you know, uh, look at whether or not uh, there was quality, the, the audits were conducted in accordance with GAAP uh, or PCOB standards, uh, that it followed firms' quality control standards, what kind of review process, um, the, you know, uh, second partner review process, challenge their decisions that they made or the judgments on how they arrived at them. So the PCOB does a pretty extensive audit of the audit firm. Okay. Um, and then they issue a report. Their reports are public um, information. And I think I might have mentioned this before. Um, most times those reports, while they're public, they don't specifically list the firm unless the firm doesn't comply with the PCOB recommendations or respond to their um, recommendations. So the PCOB has governing um, or uh, regulatory uh, responsibility over the public accounting firms. The AICPA 
still exist and will continue to exist because they have other responsibilities other than regulating the accounting profession. But there are a number of uh, maybe smaller firms that don't audit publicly held clients. The PCLB is still responsible for putting out auditing standards. I'm sorry, the AICPA is still responsible for putting out auditing standards of which firms, regardless of their size, have to follow. The only time a firm will not follow auditing standards issued by the AICPA is because those standards have been superseded by the PCAOB. But for the most part, this, the PCOB, obviously, given that it's just it's it's a fairly new um, organization, um, is now getting around to you know putting out standards. So slowly but surely, they're super, they're superseding some of the auditing standards that were issued by the AICPA's auditing standards board, um, and firms are required to follow those standards. So there's still. A, a really, the AICPA still plays a very large part in the accounting profession. Um, they also uh, are responsible for the Code of Professional Conduct, which all uh, accounting CPAs have to follow um, is, if you're a practicing CPA. Uh, compilation, they put out standards regarding compilation and review service and consulting service and other attestation services. So there's still a huge role. The AICPA plays a huge role still in the accounting profession. So I don't want you to think that they've been superseded by the PCAOB. Yes. <coughs> not on public, not on public, uh, when you say public companies, you mean public accounting firms? Yes, they do. Still have including some public accounting firms, because public accounting firms still have to follow standards. Not all of the uh, auditing standards have been superseded by the PCAOB. They're starting to. They're, and what they're doing, the P, what the PCAOB has done is they've chosen to um, rewrite standards that um, they felt haven't, where they felt auditors were not getting enough guidance in their mind from the Auditing Standards Board. So for example, uh, they identified risk assessment as being a very critical area, and they felt that the standards that existed prior were not sufficient enough. So they issued standards on a new set of standards on risk assessment. So they're starting to pick those things that they consider to be um, very important um, that they want to revise, and that's what they're doing. But auditing, all firms are still following. Um, to the extent that those standards haven't been superseded, they're, they're still following um, auditing standards issued by the ASCPA. Well, they started with that, right? So because that was the existing standards, that was the standards we had as auditors for years and years and years. And so what the PCOB has done is taken those standards that they feel are not sufficient enough and they've uh, updated them. And then so as a result, for public, if you're an audit firm and you're auditing a publicly held co company, you have to apply those, the PCLB standards. Um, if there are no PCLB standards, you apply the uh, AICPA audit standards. I, Mike? Well, they, um, it's a um, it's like a, a professional organization. So you can have so, for example, they have representatives from firms. They have uh, representatives from companies. It depends. I mean, they have different committees. So if you have, they also have um, industry groups. So naturally, you'll have a, a combination of people from industry, different companies in the industry on on that committee. Maybe uh, audit part, you know, audit partners from different firms on that committee. They have people who are not auditors at all. They, you know, they're. Um, it's an organization, a self-sufficient organization. Yeah. Okay, you can make sure that others will follow it. 
Well, remember, the accounting, the accounting profession was self-regulated. So it, 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 it kind of evolved from that. There was a self, I mean, the, and let's not get, there are state rules as well, right? Well, but they established, who established GAP? The AICPA. Or a, a variations, it, it evolved into the AICPA. Remember, the, the accounting profession is old. So, it, 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 you know, you had uh, the accounting, I think, review board or something like that. I can't even, um, so it evolved over time, but it, was, it would evolve as the profession evolved. Um, clearly, some of the, you know, a lot of the, the rules have, have to be in compliance with, let's say, for example, the SEC. So there's a lot of um, a coordination between these different aims. So the PCOB and the AICPA are, you know, there's, they're going to work together. Um, but for, if, if you get to a point where um, it's a, a audit of a publicly held company, the PCOB rules. It's they, it's they, they set the rule. Um, is there collaboration between the groups? Yes, there is collaboration. But prior to the PCAOB, this, this body, rule setting body, um, just kind of emerged over time. And they set the rules. Because it's a profession, accounting is a professional organ, it's a profession, right? So all, just like you have, um, you know, with the law, you have a, a professional body setting the law, right? Well, private companies are still the standard. You, gas gas covers private and publicly held companies. The only difference is that now that we have the PCAOB for publicly held companies, to the extent that there is a, a PCAOB standard and an a, um, uh, auditing standard issued by the uh, Auditing Standards Board, if it's a publicly held company, the PCAOB standard. Is, is the one that the audit, auditor has to follow. But audit, the, the public, large public accounting firms also have privately held clients. Their, their privately held clients are not, don't have to follow PCAOB standards. They don't have to. But if you're public, you have to follow PCAOB standards. So the, the PCAOB did not replace the AICPA. So the AICPA didn't go away. The only thing that happened, not the only thing, but the biggest thing that happened was that the AICPA, you now have this new body added to the mix, the PCAOB, and the PCAOB regu now regulates the public accounting profession. Okay. But the PCAOB can't go in and say, I want to see the books and records of, a pri it's of your client if it's a privately held client. They only have jurisdiction over public, over the public clients that you audit. So the AICPA, so, and you have a lot of firms who don't have public companies, and they have to follow. GAF is, is, is as a result of the Auditing Standards Board, right? And the other thing, that, and the key thing, and we're going to talk about this today, that the AICPA has responsibility for is the code of professional conduct right. that all auditors have. I don't care, you're a CPA. It's the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. If you're a CPA, you have to follow the pro code of professional conduct. You. Okay. So, when we talk about generally accepted auditing standards, generally accepted auditing standards fall into three key uh, main areas, and then under the, these categories are subcategories. So the three main categories making up generally accepted auditing standards are general qualifications and conduct, field work, and reporting results. So what the general qualifications and conduct refer to is, as you can imagine, would be those characteristics of the auditor, right? They have to have adequate training and proficiency. They have to be independent in mental attitude. They have, they have to exercise due professional care. Right? So the general qualifications and conduct relates to the auditor. The field work, sta field work standards okay, relate to the performance of the audit. So when you're in the field performing the audit, the proper planning and supervision. 
Um, so you have to plan it on. You can't just show you, you get the uh, you get a new client. You can't just show up and start auditing. So we're gonna t when we start talking about the audit process uh, and the different phases of the audit, we're gonna cover these types of things. So that you're properly planning the audit so that you know that you can staff the audit appropriately. You shouldn't even accept a client unless you know you have the staff with the appropriate amount of uh, professional experience and expertise to audit that client. So if you've only, if you're, you know, you let's say you've only audited governmental, you know, business, uh, governments and uh, government municipalities and nonprofits, and you have no one in your office who's ever audited a bank, you probably, you might not want to, to take on that client, you don't have the expertise because you're not going to provide your client necessarily with the the right amount of experience and expertise that you need to conduct that audit. So the field work is saying proper planning, supervision, that you have a sufficient understanding of the client, um, the environment that that client is in, and uh, its internal controls. So where when we start talking about um, inherent risk and control risk. We'll talk a lot more about how auditors obtain this information. Um, making sure that you collect sufficient, appropriate evidence because, again, remember, um, your opinion is based on the evidence that you collect. And then finally, the reporting standards, which deals with uh, the, the actual output of the audit process. So whether or not the financial statements are presented in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, right? So that the client has, you know, recorded their transactions in accordance with GAAP. Um, that if there is a departure from GAAP, okay, that that's identified in the report. Okay. Um, when we talk about uh, audit reports, we'll talk about situations when it is appropriate to have a departure from GAAP and how that's reflected in the, res in the report. Um, that the financial statements include the appropriate amount of disclosures and that there's an expression of an opinion on the financial statements. So the auditor has to say that last line has to be there. These statements are in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles um, and they're free of material misstatements. So in other words, it's an unqualified opinion. Right? or it's an adverse opinion. Whatever the auditor's opinion is, it has to be reflected in the, financial, in, in the auditor's report so that the reader of that report knows exactly what the auditor's opinion is. It can't be vague. So these are <coughs> the, what constitutes generally accepted auditing standards, three main categories. These are just subcategories, and they're going to be numerous standards because I can't even remember what number we're up to now with the standards. I know we're past 70 something that represent all of these, right? So there'll be numerous standards getting at these three categories. Okay. And so those, that's what we call a statement on auditing standards. So you'll see SAS, you'll see ASC, and some of these things have been, um, you know, superseded. Some of them have been around from the beginning of time, but those we are the statements on auditing standards, which captures the or interprets the ten generally um, accepted auditing standards. So just think back to the previous slide. Those things were really broad, right? Do professional care. Well, what does that mean? The standards, there's going to be a standard that explains the things you should do that constitute due professional care. Independence, um, what does that mean? There's a standard, there's a rule that tells you what that means. What, these are the things that uh, an auditor should do. Um, we'll have, for example, um, risk assessment. Risk assessment, there, it's a standard that tells you all of the things that the auditor should do um, and how they respond, should respond to various uh, risk assessments. So the standards are meant to interpret the generally um, accepted auditing standards or the statements on auditing standards. Okay, we're, just to mention this, but we're not going to cover it. Uh, I don't even, uh, I didn't include this chapter from the 
text, but there are international standards on auditing. We are not going to focus on those. Um, we're going to only look at um, uh, U.S. standards. I only kind of raise this and say because I know in financial accounting you've probably talked about um, international financial reporting standards, the whole convergence to that. The U.S. has hasn't uh, converted obviously, but there's you know I, um, a consensus that at some point we will. Um, along that line, there there is a board. Uh, that's looking at international auditing standards as well. It's nowhere in terms of convergence. We're nowhere near where we are in the discussion uh, related to IFRS, but there are international auditing standards. I think I already said this, but just to reiterate it, um, when we talk about GAAP, generally accepted auditing standards, that continues to be used for um, audits of private companies, um, public company audits in the audit report is going to refer to PCAOB auditing standards. So if it's a publicly held company, their audit opinion is going to refer to the PCAOB. If it's a privately held company, it's going to refer to um, generally accepted auditing standards. Okay. Quickly, um, accounting firms are expected to have quality control standards. Um, and some of the key things that, uh, for example, if the PCAOB came in some of the key, and they evaluated the firm's quality control standards, some of the things that they would be looking for is to ensure that um, the firm has a way to communicate, to ensure, to monitor that their employees are independent, that the engagements their audit engagements, that there's this attitude of independence, integrity, and objectivity, that they're monitoring this. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about independence a little later, but with independence, they're expected to monitor um, their, uh, the independence of their employees. Most firms will have um, a checklist, a questionnaire that their employees have to fill out on a regular basis to ensure that they don't have any direct financial interest in clients. That so that they have some policy, some procedure in place to monitor that, um, that there's personnel management ensuring that the, when they assign people to audit engagements, that the people have the right amount of experience, the right amount of supervision, um, that in terms of their clients, that when they, they have procedures in place to um, guide the acceptance of clients, so we'll talk about this um, in a couple of weeks, risk assessment, uh, making sure that they assess the integrity of the client, um, same procedures for continuation of clients. So most firms go through this process where even though they've had the client for maybe two or three years, they do um, a client's continuance procedure, so they're still looking at management integrity, check, looking at uh, the business environment for that client, looking at the business risk for that client, assessing the risk profile of the client. Um, engagement and performance, so that this is, after the, so all engagements are going to have a budget. Uh, all engagements, audit engagements, there are probably going to be issues that arise. How those issues were resolved, were, um, how, you know, what adjustments were booked, meaning that they were uh, included in the financial statements versus waived, the rationale behind that. Um, how closely were the, the engagement finished on budget, or if there were uh, budget overruns, what was the problem, you know, what caused those. So just monitoring the performance of the engagement. And then monitoring overall, it's, even though the PCAOB comes in and does an inspection of the company, of the firm's clients, uh, a selected client, they don't do 100% of them. Um, but it's also the firm's responsibility to kind of monitor um, their performance on, on audit engagement. So you will see that firms will have their own inspection process in place. So, for example, a partner, partners or an audit team or an inspection team from the New York office might go out and audit, uh, select audits in the Chicago office and, and do a review. Because it's similar to internal audit. A company wants to know if there are problems before a, regula a regulator comes in or before the, uh, for a company, they'll have an internal audit group. 
they, they want their internal audit group to make sure that the company is complying with the procedures and policies, right? And so the same thing for audit firms. They want to make sure that their offices and, and their audit, the audit teams are complying with the company's rules and their policies and their procedures. They don't want the PCAOB to come in and find a problem. So just to summarize, with respect to a CPA firm and its personnel, if it's a publicly held company, for publicly held companies, they have to be aware of and adhere to standards, rules, and regulations of the PCOB and the SEC. Um, oh, just a point on the SEC that I forgot to talk about when we were talking about standards. The PCOB issues standards, AICPA, and the, SA, the SEC will also issue statements, um, uh, staff uh, uh, audit bulletins, or uh, I think staff audit bulletins or accounting bulletins. And so, for example, if the SEC for, uh, has enforcement, responsibility. So they might issue um, a bulletin um, based on things that they're seeing as, as a result of looking at 10Ks or enforcement releases that then becomes, for the most part, becomes a requirement so that firms have to follow, audit firms have to follow. You see this much less, but uh, you will see um, staff accounting bulletins that are being, that are issued by the SEC. Um, the Code of Professional Conduct, which we're going to talk about um, a little later on. The AICPA practice sections, I mentioned that the AICPA has, um, for industries, they might have very specific practice sections because their uh, practices and uh, procedures in, that are unique to those particular industries. Um, the firms have to be mindful of their of legal liability, and we'll talk more about this toward the end of the semester. But um, you know, because there are third parties who rely on the information or the audit report, um, and I talked, I think, uh, last week a little bit about the expectations gap. Firms. Our audit firms are seen as having deep pockets, especially the larger firms. And so if there's an audit failure or an accounting failure, people are going to look a lot of times to sue the auditors to recover their losses. So uh, firms are, you know, always have to be mindful of that and, and I'm sure they insure themselves against uh, legal law, legal liability. Continuing education requirements is really key. What you'll find is that in order to maintain your license, you have to uh, you have to continue to be educated. So you, and if you're in a firm, this becomes really easy because they just send you to a course and tell you, okay, you know, you are, uh, you, it's time for you to, you know, satisfy your continuing education requirements. It varies by state what the requirements are. Um, we talked about generally accepted accounting standards. Uh, the CPA examination, obviously you can't become a CPA if you don't pass the exam. And also there are some there are, uh, experience requirements related to that. Um, again, with firms, uh, it's, they monitor this in terms of, in, because in firms you cannot rise above a certain level um, unless you're certified. So I don't think you can become manager in most firms without being certified. You have to be certified before becoming a manager. Um, and certainly you can't become a partner if you're not certified, at least, and not a partner doing audit work, because you do have partners in other non-audit types of, um, where you're not signing an audit opinion. Uh, quality control we talked about in this peer review process. Prior to um, the PCAOB, and firms, I don't know how much they do this now, if, given the PCOB, but prior to the PCOB, uh, firms would have, um, the AICPA had a peer review program. And so uh, they, w and firms participated in this peer review program. So for example, KPMG might go out and do a peer review of Price Waterhouse, and Price Waterhouse would go out and do a peer review of Deloitte Touche. Um, I don't know to what extent this program still exists or how much it's done at this point because of the PCOB um, coming in and doing inspections, but that was something um, that the profession had when it regulated itself. Okay, Whew, that was quick. 
at least it felt quick to me. So questions about, it's just a quick overview of the profession. So you understand. So we'll get into the standards more as we go along, but um, any questions about, all right, so why don't we take um, a 10 minute break, and then when we come back, we'll talk about independence.